Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors, Goliath Technologies, who help IT pros be proactive and anticipate, troubleshoot, and prevent end-user experience issues, regardless of where IT workloads or users are located. And also by Liquidware, the creators of FlexApp, the most feature-rich application layering product on the market. And also brought to you by PolicyPack Software, Policy Pack is where you use Group Policy or MDM to remove admin rights, manage and lock down applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware. If the audio levels are a little bit different, I hope they're better than usual. That is because I am recording on a new laptop and soon I'm going to actually invest in a new microphone and get a completely new setup. And that's made possible by having sponsors on the podcast. So. If you appreciate the podcast each week, you have them to thank. And now for some news. ThreatPost has reported that Microsoft have issued an out-of-band Internet Explorer patch to address a remote code execution flaw. The Internet Explorer zero-day vulnerability is CVE-2019-1367. Also addressed in out-of-band patching, is CVE-2019-1255, which is a denial of service flaw in Microsoft Defender. The IE vulnerability obviously by its nature is quite dangerous as it could mean an attacker being able to gain access and possibly get an admin account in your environment to execute malicious code. The Defender denial of service exploit could be leveraged by an attacker who uses the vulnerability to prevent legitimate accounts from executing legitimate system binaries. The Internet Explorer vulnerability is currently being exploited. So this is one of those cases where they've rushed an emergency patch out and you really should plan on deploying it as soon as possible. And speaking of vulnerabilities, VMware have published a list of vulnerabilities in their products and available fixes that are available, including for products, VMware vSphere ESXi, VMware Workstation Pro or Player, VMware Fusion Pro, VMware Remote Console for Windows or VMRC, VMware Remote Console for Linux, VMRC for Linux, VMware Horizon Client for Windows, VMware Horizon Client for Linux, and VMware Horizon Client for Mac. Ironically and probably more predictably, the vulnerabilities include a remote execution vulnerability, CVE-2019-5527, and that affects ESXi, Workstation, Fusion, VMRC, and Horizon Client. And there's also a denial of service vulnerability patched CVE-2019-5535, which affects VMware, Workstation, and Fusion. I just actually had an exchange on Twitter this week with Simon Deathling talking about how it seems like patching is becoming a full-time job again, like it was a few years ago because the technology just wasn't very streamlined. Now we've got the technology of the products that help streamline the actual patching process, but there's just so many vulnerabilities and so many patches that it's still becoming quite a full-time job just keeping on top of things, in my opinion. PowerShell App Deployment Toolkit version 3.8.0 has been released. It has added some nice cosmetic changes including the ability to modify the banner height and configure a maxim- maximum height, as well as the ability to add animated GIFs into the banner and more. There is an added architecture independence for zero touch MSIs where file names end in x64.msi or x86 MSI. There's improved logging and many fixes plus more. Microsoft have announced the depreciation of basic authentication connections for Exchange Online for protocols that include Exchange Web Services, Exchange Active Sync or EAS, IMAP4, POP3, and Remote PowerShell. The date set for depreciation is October 13, 2020, and is usually the case with Microsoft, I guess we'll see in this case, but usually depreciation doesn't mean it's just being turned off right away. It just means that you know it's in this state where it's not getting any love and you really need to consider getting away from it because soon the hammer is going to drop and it's just going to be uh, out of there. 
but we'll see. Maybe it's different this time. Maybe they're just dropping the hammer right away. ZDNet reports that Red Hat had a rolling release version of CentOS called CentOS Stream. With the rolling release, the OS, kernel, libraries, utilities, and applications continuously get updated. It is said with the rapid development cycles that now exist with the advent of microservices, containers, Kubernetes, etc., a distribution that can keep up with these developments is required, thus CentOS Stream. If you need a stable CentOS release to work off of that's not constantly in that update flow, CentOS will still be there for you. But if you need to keep up with your competitors who are building new cloud and container-based applications, CentOS Stream will work better for you. Microsoft released a pricing calculator for Windows Virtual Desktop. It's pretty nice. It allows you to save your work, export to Excel, or share it as a link. If you're curious about pricing based on VM types, um, like multi-user versus single-user desktops, it's definitely worth a look. Personally, I think the Cloud Jumper calculator that's also freely available online is a little bit better for visualizing as you can quickly figure out where the pricing at scale makes sense. Like for example, you'll see that, hmm, I only have maybe 50 users. Putting them on multi-session Windows 10 doesn't really make sense for the price point. They're probably better with the personal desktops versus I have a few thousand users, maybe the multi-session OS makes a bit more sense in that case. So I definitely suggest checking that out and just playing around with the numbers and you'll see where I guess the crunch point is for each. And speaking of Windows Virtual Desktop, it is now available to run in the West Europe Region Data Center in Azure. The godfather of AppV, Tim Mangan, tweeted this week that he has encountered an AppV issue on Windows 10 1903. Tim is seeing issues with a DLL not found when in the virtual file system system folder. The workaround is to copy the DLL to the CWD in the package. Jay Barker on Twitter also confirmed the issue, stating that the issue he noticed was with the vcomp100.dll. Speaking of annoying errors, a note to anyone trying to upgrade Citrix virtual apps and desktops to 1909. If you use PVS, you'll need to install the PVS target device agent before installing the VDA or upgrading the VDA. If you don't do it in that order, you'll get the old setup failed error that was also encountered in previous versions. So that error is back. If you're listening to the audio only version of the podcast and you're wondering what that error is, I'm showing it in the video version on YouTube. So if you want to take a look or if you just want to Go to reference links for this episode on 5bytespodcast.com, which is episode 91. I'll provide a link. Belarus has become the first country to make IP version 6 mandatory for internet service providers by presidential decree, so it's law. According to ZDNet, currently IP version 6 adoption in Belarus is about 15% on average, which is under the 29% global average. However, adoption rates have sometimes spiked over 30% during past tests. But starting with the new year, this is expected to grow as local ISPs will have to enable support for all connections. This is interesting because chatter of switching wholesale to IP version 6 has all but died down in recent years. It seemed everyone was aware that IP version 4 IP addresses were becoming scarce and would soon run out. The threat still looms, but the focus doesn't seem to be on it anymore. It is interesting that Belarus as a country is taking this action, and more should probably follow suit. Thanks to Andreas Nick for sharing this next one. His eagle eye spotted an interesting bit of information on a Citrix presentation slide. App DNA is officially being deprecated in 1909 with Microsoft App Assurance listed as an alternative. The thing, to me at least, is that App Assurance doesn't offer what App DNA does. It's a completely different thing. I didn't rely on AppDNA reports completely, but the tool had its usefulness for setting rough expectations at the beginning of a migration project, and I loved it most of all for its almost endless automated packaging options. Farewell, AppDNA. With so many organizations still early in their Windows 10 migrations, I fear you have gone too soon. And now this episode's weekly webinar. 
Citrix will be hosting a webinar on September 25th, which very well may be in the past by the time you listen to this podcast, but it's one worth noting as they intend to discuss the upcoming Q4 long-term service release, or LTSR. Some on Twitter have suggested that the next LTSR version will be 1912. On the webinar, you'll also learn about extended Azure capabilities with Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop, simplified deployments with Citrix Managed Desktops, and feature enhancements in the latest cloud and current release. It will be held at 10 a.m. Eastern and repeated again at 2 p.m. Eastern. And now a couple of scripts, tricks, and tips. My buddy Remco shared a PowerShell script that sets a registry key to suppress the EULA pop-up when launching SysInternals tools. So, very simple, it's a one-liner, but if you use SysInternals tools a lot, it's gonna be handy and it'll save you some nuisance. And also while I'm talking about something Remco has contributed, I will be presenting a session at E2EVC in Lisbon with Remco on kind of like a state of the union of application virtualization and application delivery. So if you're going to E2EVC, be sure to check out the session. If you're not, and it sounds like something of interest to you, try to come along. And I saw another couple of cool scripts from Eric at zenapblog.com. He shared a really great post with a couple of PowerShell scripts. He states he was working on a WEM cloud project and wanted to publish application shortcuts, which required him to pull a list of apps in users' existing start menus today and then replicate that using WEM. He has a script that can list what's in the user's current start menu, so that allows you to map out and kind of replicate it within WEM. But then he noticed that, well, he still needed the .ico files for the icons in order to populate in WEM. And he got those through a mix of PowerShell scripts, which he shares, and in the event of MSIs, he pointed out that he used the excellent master packager tool, which I've talked about quite a bit on previous episodes of the podcast. And that's it for another episode. This episode is a bit shorter than usual, I think. We'll see once I edit it. And that's because I recorded last week's episode a little bit later. I actually re-recorded last week's episode. I recorded it on last Wednesday. Then I went to the CUGC in Dublin. So I didn't get a chance to publish it. And a whole bunch of news happened on Thursday and Friday. So I figured I'd just re-record it. And that's why the episode was longer than usual and probably why this one's going to be a little shorter than usual. If you like the podcast, I'd really appreciate if you could go to your podcast platform of choice and rate it. I think rating helps with the ranking of the podcast. So if people are searching for IT or tech-related podcasts, it might help boost it in the rankings. Also, if you want to tell your friends, I won't complain about that. Well, that's it for another episode. Thank you all so much for listening.